by Michel Bernay um, about uh, the timbre of the piano, which was also the topic of his uh, PhD thesis, which uh, he uh, got from Montreal University. He then worked as a postdoc researcher in uh, at McGill, but in the lab of Marcelo uh, Wanderley, uh, which is uh, concerned with uh, musical interfaces and musical instruments. Uh, and it's from yes, your Thank you. So, hi everyone. I am Marcelo I'm very pleased and very honored to be here. And I also want to thank Harry and Guy for inviting me and for making a great work organizing this workshop. So I'm going to talk about uh, piano timbre in uh, piano performance. This is uh, my PhD research in this foundation. Okay. So this is the plan. I will first introduce the concepts and then switch to the experimental study the conductive number. So when we speak of piano timbre, in this case, I will speak about the timbre of the performance. It's not just the timbre of the instruments, like different pianos having different timbres, but how the performer can, can use his, um, his performance to bring out artistic expression. So it's something that's been well used by composers for a long time. And it's something very important in piano pedagogy. So I use a quote from the Russian uh, National House. He says that since music is a tonal art, the most important task, the primary duty of any performer is to work on tone. So, hooray for timbre. The thing being that he used the, I'm cheating a little bit because he uses the word tone, which is not exactly a synonymous to timbre, because it also entails something more idiosyncratic, some, the, the, the tone of a pianist, even whichever the circumstance. So, it's quite a bit different. But uh, I'll do something to, to dis disregard this, this issue as to talk about tone, Nagel's use uh, verbal descriptors. So I think he uses words like full, um, uh, sharp, all those like that, round. And this makes for a rich verbal description, which relates to verbal description of timbre in a more general context. So something that is less less uh, idiosyncratic. So yes, indeed, there is a rich vocabulary of image term to illustrate the vast palette of temporal nuances. And it's something that is used in pedagogy. It's especially true in French language, because the word timbre is commonly used. And pianists know what it means to talk about something round or sharp or uh, bright, whatever. Uh, but the question is now, how can such nuances be controlled on the piano? Since in first approximation, pianists can only control the hammer velocity by the pressing key. So then, in this case, piano timbre is indissociable from intensity and uh, there's nothing more to it. And it was something you heard in the scientific community for a long time. But the thing is, it may, it may be true for a single iso iso isolated key, only if you disregard the mechanical and contact noises that, are, are, that have been shown recently by Goebel and others that it plays a role in the timbre that, are, that arises from one zero key. And the other thing is in the musical context, uh, it's polyphonic. So it's not just single notes isolated. So our hypothesis yeah, is the uh, implication of the relation between notes through articulation which, are, which can add additional control parameters, may explain the role of touch in piano playing. And the way to define that would be sonic elements merging as detected by articulation. So once again, I also talks of uh, sound molecules made of atom notes. And we propose to call it the emerging composite numbers. So within, with these composite numbers, there are verbal descriptors, once again, as was probably mentioned, the semantic September. So back to it. So it all started with a qualitative study in our lab where uh, pianist interviews managed to gather uh, a long list of terms that were used in uh, piano practice. And they were um, qualitatively arranged by the uh, 
homogeneity to each other, so they did the left wall picture. And after that, conducted a quantitative study. <coughs> so asking, uh, it was a similarity rating between the most uh, common timber descriptors from the previous study. And we, uh, using a multidimensional scaling, we uh, arrived at a two-dimensional configuration. So we can see they mostly match between each other. And uh, really good, the, the point we wanted to make was to find and identify clusters of descriptors. So this clustering here, the, the five groups, are confirmed by uh, your people clustering. And we opted to select five precise descriptors. So as you can see, it's a dry, bright, round, velvet, and dark, for which to study the, the performance. So here are the study of explosive performance parameters for fractional timbers and for pianists. So the method was we use the <coughs> five timber descriptors. We uh, five performers agreed to the experiment. We had four short pieces composed for the study. And each piece was to be played with the five different work answers. So here are the four pieces. Uh, I guess I have time. Rapidly, just to illustrate the different numbers as well. sensors on key hammers and pedals to track uh, key pedal depression, depression and hammer velocity at a very high uh, 500 Hz uh, sampling with resolution. So this will allow a fine grain measure of touch. So I developed a MATLAB toolbox to analyze the, such data. So for example, uh, it allows for a precise key tracking which I show in a piano roll display. So instead of just having straight up square notes as in MIDI, you can actually <coughs> see the details of the key depression. Just really reach a peak, stabilize, and then it's really slowly. This kind of thing. Uh, from this point in this data, I could extract a lot of very fine grained performance descriptors. So this is a rough presentation of several semi-time measures. So the exact attack speed, uh, maximum velocity, duration of attacks, instead of edit, the key depression, and other feature articulation and between chords, so overlap between chords, and stuff like that. So five kind of chambers to study. And using analysis of the data gathered for more performances, uh, we first used a, a PCA to get a, a two-dimensional performance space, which could explain most of the variance in the data. So you can see that we can again find an arrangement of the different timbres which matches what we got from the semantics. So the, the picture is kind of blurry because uh, well, a lot of lots of data makes for a lot of noise, but you can still see that there is a an orientation from um, yeah, can you tell the colors? So from velvety to dry, you can see there is a difference. But uh, more informative would be to we look in detail with a three-way uh, repeated measures and LOR to re-examine the the contribution of each of the descriptors from the performance, and we create a precise map 
of all different chambers were characterized to the 13 most uh, significant descriptors that we collected. So you can see, for instance, that in green here is the dry chamber, which on average uses high and velocity. So it could be described with high intensity. On the other side, very short attacks. Uh, key depressions, which tended to be kind of shallow. Uh, the articulation, very staccato. And uh, barely the use of the pedals. And it works for all number this way. So, the other point of the study is we have four pianists. So, we wanted to see what was consistent in their performance. And now the four pianists could play the different timbre, were their characteristics overwhelming, or were well, there are many commonalities. So, using the same procedure, we arrived to individual performance spaces. So these are this time in three dimensions. So we can see that the, the four performers can be set apart, obviously, along three dimensions. Uh, using the loadings from the PCA, you mostly see that the first dimension uh, mostly describes attack and dynamics. The second being more uh, the duration of notes, and the third one more oriented towards articulation. So likewise, we can have individual performance portraits to see how different pianists play differently. Some things are very salient, so like one pianist uh, resulted in higher angular velocity, so basically played louder. And, and use of the pedal is also very peculiar for one of the pianists. But what gets interesting is when we combine those two things <coughs> to see how the piano timbres interact with the pianist. So we could get a portrait, separate portrait of the timbre, which are completely invaluable for each pianist, and summarize the next table. So there you can see for example that hammer velocity was something very important for three of the pianists in producing different timbres while mostly inconclusive for uh, inconsistent for another one. And things like that. So we so we can see that pianists kind of use the same strategy but not always. That for example not duration, which will relate to tempo, was not used by one of the pianists. Uh, use of pedal also was very peculiar. So something like that. Then I'm gonna go straight to the summary of all this. Which is that there were three types of parameters. The first type was we could identify some piano performance parameters which highlighted only the pianist individuality and only differ between pianists. So, dynamic differences between end. Some pianists would favor the right end in loudness over the, right, the left and vice versa. Also, the variation in time. Some pianists would use more difference in dynamics over the the length of each piece, uh, the type of attack in the, in the percussiveness of the key, which we find by some than by other, uh, variation in attack depth, or, for, or how much the key was depressed, internal set intervals as probably a proxy for tempo, and the use of part pedaling on stop pedal, which was used by some of the others. On the other hand, there were some performance parameters which highlighted only the difference between timbres. So using variation in the right handed dynamics only. Uh, sustaining the, the chord with the left hand or the right hand articulation and part pedaling with the sustained pedal. Or something that were used by all pianists to differentiate between the five timbres. And finally, the largest category was the performance parameters which were involved both in uh, identifying pianists' singularity and in showing differences between timbres. So obviously, uh, something very notorious is that amorous. So the dynamics were varied for different timbres. 
but also we use different rebate performance. Uh, likewise for our attack velocity and the depth of attack. Uh, metal delete, but also different for both timber and, and pianist. So it was shown again by global as being an artifact of intensity, so it makes sense. Key release durations were different as, a, as an articulation feature. Uh, likewise, the articulation in the left hand was used for both timber and for each penis over here. And pedal use uh, is obviously something important for timber and as well different for each penis. So, in conclusion, uh, we managed to get quantified, quantified parameters of explosive piano performance. A better understanding of pianist strategy for expressing timbres. And studies that highlight, highlighted that there is a coexistence of both individual styles and the common approaches with temporary expressive piano performance. So, there we could can get back to the, to the world and the ontology of tone, where it has both patterns, one being something as a tone quality of a timbre which can be shared by pianists and the other part being something quite idiosyncratic, which can both be found in the parameters of piano performance. So the other part I thought uh, I wouldn't have time to talk about is obviously the perception of piano timbre analysis. So in the study we've shown that from this excerpt and the, these recordings, uh, the nuances of timbre that pianists wanted to express were largely identifiable. Uh, I said largely because essentially bright, dry, and round were very clearly identifiable, and there was a lot of confusion between the other two, which were dark and dirty, which showed that the two nuances are, are closer, and it matches the fact that there are uh, two nuances out to differentiate from the performance data. And the first study uh, used the uh, MIDI based digital simulations. So, in essence, I took MIDI data from the recordings, fed them to a physical modeling algorithm, uh, the commercial uh, software Pianotech, and tried to uh, and run perception tests to see whether the temporal information was conserved by uh, using software and by reducing data to just MIDI. And he, it was shown that this, uh, this <coughs> procedure did not affect timbre uh, identification. So it suggests that in uh, MIDI data, the, the, the first order um, identification of timbre is conserved. So it may not hold true for very detailed uh, and final nuances, but for the broad strokes of uh, timbre definition, uh, MIDI is no impediment. So, of course, what, what's missing from my presentation is the acoustical correlates with these timbres, and this is a, a work in progress right now at University of Montreal, which I'm not in Brooklyn, so I won't tell you about it. And there are several possible perspectives uh, about, of course, piano pedagogical method. So using something more quantitative to back up the uh, error-based and intuition-based approach to timbre. It could also play a role in uh, digital piano synthesis, uh, at least as a quality control. So verifying that timbre nuances can be conserved by synthesis. And also in, as a step of simulation to simulate performances and maybe give an interface where you can control the, the timbre nuances directly as a, a meta parameter. And also in something that I would call performance information retrieval. Uh, it's something that uh, it was used at the point by a company to uh, take audio recordings of all performances, uh, replay them, and sell them commercially so that you would have uh, Rackman enough playing on a, on, a, on a bright new CD. But this kind of stuff could be done by, for example, taking MIDI data from recordings, extracting uh, performance parameters, and making uh, assumptions about which timbre was, which timbre would characterize the piece. So since I have more time, I'm going to 
go to some sounds. So yeah, this is the, the main result of the study. So here is a dry example. about touch and that gives her kind of a, a uh, way to leave something in that conundrum. So that is, is, a, is a way to do something new if you don't know uh, where you want to go. So where, what, what is the relation? I really also loved your suggestion to say let's speak about tone because that gives us then again the time is the broad realm and tone is kind of the individual pass through. But um, what's next? So, yeah, so, yeah, about tone, yeah, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it. It's different in English and in French because in French there is no word that corresponds to tone. We have basically timbre, which is the timbre, and the other would be son, sound. Mm -hmm. you know, and nothing in between. In English it's a little different because tone encapsulates something in between. So, yeah, was, and yeah, about Marie so, yeah, that's me to make comparison because of. She made a lot of conjectures about piano touch and stuff like that, but uh, <laughs> quite out there, I must say. Yeah, <laughs> um, so what was your... you had another question? Yeah, well, she, she, uh, I think she, had, she left open that, that possibility to find something new, because she also couldn't find her. Uh, as you know, she used fingerprints, so now you have something like the real fingerprint of the of the piano playing individual, which is which is bizarre because you think um, where where is the, the openness for finding something new that you really know about all the things you need to do for good playing? Then you really press a key to have this kind of velvety sound and press another key to have that kind of dry sound. Is that interesting? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I know. I guess the point would be that the further we can have precise information about what to do. 
the further human players would be able to go even further. Right? So put an, another layer of subtlety within that. Maybe, for example, if it was something, if you could, if you could teach the right way to play a certain type of timbre, straight up without getting it out to the concept, mental conception and imagination, then it would give the, the, the pianist more new way to add something to it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so maybe pushing the subtlety of piano playing even further out. Or, or maybe maybe nobody would play the piano anymore, everybody would play a key on, on the computer or let it run, I don't know. <laughs> so maybe in the background we can already change the computer uh, while we have more time for questions or comments. Um, did you find any um, community or inverse correlation between the factors that didn't seem to Say like someone seems to try and create a bright part of the piano. Yeah. So, <laughs> say the pianist was trying to develop a bright tone of the piano and you found that like no one's using the soft pedal or a subset of people were using the soft pedal, you can only use it when you do this other factor as well. Did you find anything like that for the factors that didn't seem to correlate with that uh, That's a good question. Um, I don't remember if I checked that. I, I know uh, uh, I think I separated all the different categories, so I didn't check correlation between pedals and articulation <coughs> or dynamics. So I don't think I did, uh, and I think I should have. Would you think intuitively that would be a factor, or do you think it's not going to be a factor though, based on your interpretation of the data? I don't know. I think. I sort of. I think. It, I would say it, it, it depends on the two chances. Uh, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a, it's a question of sample size. So only four pianists, so it's hard to generalize. And, and I know the one pianist can need to use the pedal a lot less. So for instance, it, it will be very right significant. So over, over a very large sample size, uh, I guess you could have correlation between articulation and, and pedaling for sure. So, thank you very much again.